Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. Welcome to A Life Less Traveled. Hi, I'm your host, Michael Wentink. I'm 41 years old and live in San Antonio, Texas with my wife and two beautiful children. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis back in 2008 and I write about my journey of living with MS, and you can check that out on my website at mjwentink.com. Once again, that's mjwentink, W-E-N-T-I-N-K, dot com. I share some of the stories with the National MS Society, and they post them up on their blog page at the msconnection.org, or you can also find them at themighty.com. If you're on Twitter, you can find me on Twitter at M-J-W-E-N-T-I-N-K. Once again, that's at M-J-W-E-N-T-I-N-K. Please feel free to shoot me a tweet. I would love to connect. Today on the seventh episode of A Life Less Traveled, we're going to talk about going to the movies. In particular, one movie. Groundhog Day. That was one of my favorite movies growing up. It stars Bill Murray, and he plays the character of Phil, Collin- Phil Connors. He's a Pittsburgh weatherman who, while he's he's covering the annual Groundhog Day event in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, you know, they, each year the groundhog comes out, right? And does he see a shadow? Does he not see a shadow? And and I'll determine maybe if there's going to be six more weeks of winter or not. And, you know, he's, he's a weatherman that's going to cover this event. And he goes and he stays there in, in locally in the town in a bed and breakfast. And he goes and covers the event. And, and he's ready, you know, to get going after the event. He just wants to get back home. He's kind of, you know, arrogant about staying in the town and you know he's a he's a local pittsburgh weatherman but he has bigger thoughts in life you know he's expecting to be doing much much more and he's thinking it's going to be happening soon but what happens while he's out there he ends up getting caught up in this like time loop where the same day keeps playing over and over and over again you know when when you're younger, you watch movies and you maybe you like really enjoy a movie for whatever reason it might be. And then years later, you start watching that movie again. It's like a movie of your youth, right? And sometimes what happens is that you're watching that movie from your youth and you're like just, it's almost like you're grimacing as you're going through it. You know, you're checking the time on your watch. Like, is this is this ending? And you know, your your eyes are rolling. You're like, wow, I actually liked this when I was younger. You know, sometimes movies don't. Some movies don't age well. And sometimes, you know, may, maybe we just change. We're not the same as we were when we were younger. So we we just don't enjoy it as much as we thought we did. And maybe we were just in a different place in life when we did enjoy it. With uh, watching Groundhog Day, that certainly was not the case. I still, you know, had lots of laughs. You know, I I watched it in 1993 and there's a line in it where, you know, one, one of the characters... Uh, you know that that runs into Phil Collins. He's an old Phil Connors. He's an old high school, you know, uh, acquaintance of him there. And he has this line where he's like, you know, "Am I right or am I right? Right, right, right." And you know, there's there's, there's been no very few times in my life where maybe I'm talking to my kiddos or you know I'm talking to my wife. If I'm not thinking about it in my head. When I when I'm asking the question like, well, am I right about this? You know, it's like I want to add in, or am I right? Or am I right, right, right? You know, it's just like it's hard not to just do it. It's just it's one of those movies or the lines that they kind of just stick with you. And you know, something else that sticks stuck with me 
is, you know, when the character Phil Connors, he wakes up that first morning on Groundhog's Day and the, his, his alarm clock goes off in the room and it's like a radio alarm clock and it starts playing the song, you know, I Got You Babe by, you know, Sonny, uh, you know, Sonny and Cher. And, you know, the song's briefly on and then the, the DJs come on, they are doing their silly, you know, jokes and, and everything like that. But so in our house, of course, on Groundhog's Day, I'm always playing I Got You, Babe. Yeah, you know, it's it's playing on the radio or it's, you know, playing throughout our house. That's where our children wake up to for school. And I always had to make a joke or maybe I go into the room and I wake them up. But then I come back later and I'm doing the same thing again. It's just, again, it's one of those movies that it stuck with me. I mean, it's just the humor of it, you know, kind of just, you know, really connected with me. And, and so on this Groundhog's Day, we decided it was on a Friday and well, let's have a family night and let's watch the movie again. And it was not a situation where I was grimacing through it and I was like, wow, I can't believe I liked this movie when I was younger. It was you know, situation where I was like, this is, this is an awesome movie. And, you know, still had plenty of laughs, but, you know, as I was watching it, I was just getting this feeling in, inside and I couldn't quite place what it was that I was feeling. And, and then at, at a certain point in the movie, it dawned on me. And, you know, this, this 1993 classic, this 1993 movie, it had so many parallels for to me for being diagnosed and living with multiple sclerosis I mean just think of how bizarre that sounds I know but that's just it, it just it was just striking me during the movie I was like well you know this is and I would pause it because I'd be talking to you know my kiddos about certain things because you know it is if your child if you haven't seen the movie and if you're interested in showing it to your you know your children there is there's, you know, adult themes in it. There's no bad language or anything like that. Not a lot anyways, but there's just certain things where, you know, when my wife and I, when we watch a movie that's, you know, not a G rated movie with our children, you know, we sometimes I'll pause it to kind of explain certain situations or things that are happening um, and help them understand and, you know, just make sure that they understand what, what's going on in it. But, you know, as I was, you know, going through the movie, I was just struck by how many just parallels it had to when I was diagnosed and how I felt. I related to this guy that was, you know, living in this time loop. I mean, the, the character Phil Connors is not that that necessarily remind me of a person when I was younger. I mean, he's a, you know, an arrogant weatherman who's looking to hit it big somewhere else. You know, that's but it was the situation that he found himself in. He, you know, he went to the, the, the Groundhog Day, you know, event and, and he, he wanted to hurry up and leave it as soon as it was done. And so he was ready getting his crew together. He's like, all right, let's head back to Pittsburgh. We're out of here. But he ended up getting caught up in a snowstorm. Ironically, he's a weatherman, and, and he had said that there was no, there wasn't going to be a snowstorm. It ended up being a blizzard, so the roads were closed, and he wasn't, they weren't able to travel back. So he had to go back to where he was staying, and that was, you know, the local bed and breakfast there. And so he goes and, you know, back to his room. He doesn't want to hang out with this crew or anyone else that's there. You know, he just, you know, who wanted to be by himself, you know. And uh, he kind of was holding himself above everyone else. Like, oh, you guys go, you know, some dinner. I'm, I'm going to go back to my room and, you know, do what people like me do. You know, I, I don't need to be around you all. And so, you know, he goes back to his room and, and he goes to sleep and he wakes up the next morning and he hears, I got you, babe, on the radio. You know, 6 a.m., the, the alarm clock radio goes off. And he starts thinking, you know, okay, that's, this is weird, you know, and, and then sure enough, you know, cause it's near the end of the song when it's playing and then the DJs start talking and they're saying the same thing again. And he's like, well, what's going on? You know, I mean, you guys, you know, he was thinking they had like the same record going again. And, and so then 
he's walking around, you know, and you know, he's starting to get ready for the day. And he looks out the window and realizes that there's there's no snow on the ground. It, and he's just so confused. He's like, what is going on? How, how could that blizzard, how could all that snow be gone? And, and he, he leaves his room and in everything just starts happening over and over and over again. He re, he's running into the same people They're They're having the same conversation, you know, with him. How, how, how did you sleep? Mr. Connors, you know, and, how do you know how, how, how's your day going are you going to the groundhog day festival i mean it's just all these things and it was it was freaking him out and in a way you know when you're when you're diagnosed you know th this was the first stage of being diagnosed where phil when he woke up and all this was occurring and, and in this chronological order of these things occurring, it was like he was just, he was stunned. He was shocked. He didn't know really how to respond. And as things kept on happening, where it's like the Groundhog Day Festival happened again, and then they couldn't leave again because the blizzard was hitting and he was stuck in the town again, it was like for him it was like this giant deja vu i mean it truly was you know like a giant deja vu but as he tried to explain it to people they couldn't really understand what he was saying they couldn't get inside his head they couldn't connect with him he felt like he was just on this island by himself and you know that first stage of being diagnosed you know with, with ms that's kind of what it's like First, you have that jarring shock where it's like this slap in the face where it's like, whoa, what's going on? And then, you know, you're you're trying to explain to people or talk to people about what you have. And it's just it's hard to explain when it's happening. You, you want people to know what you're saying and, and to hear what you're saying, but it's really hard to do that. And and that was what was happening with him and then you know he kind of progressed to the next stage where you know he was having this realization period where he was like well um i i you know this is three or four or five days in where he kind of just you know he keeps waking up and the same things happening over and over and over again and and I think for a lot of people, they react many different ways to being diagnosed with, with a disease like MS or, you know, in my case, it was MS. And, you know, for Phil Connors, when he was having this realization that he was stuck in this time loop and there was, to his best of knowledge, like there was nothing he could do about it, he almost kind of, you know, came to this realization where he's like, well, well, this is actually pretty cool. I can eat whatever I want. You know, I can, I can drink whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. There are no consequences to anything. That's what he was thinking, you know? So it's like he could, you know, he started talking to a lady there because you know, he can make friends with her and everything. And, and he finds out, oh, she likes this kind of music or, or she likes, you know, to eat this kind of chocolate, you know, and he'll wait till the next day and then he can use that again because now he knows that, you know, it's, it's almost like he started using, he wasn't using the things for good. There was, you know, a local bank and, you know, the people were doing a drop off of the money and, and he would timed it where he could walk over and just grab, you know, the, uh, the money that, you know, the guards had absentmindedly left out there in the open. So he wasn't, you know, it was almost like he had this superpower of having no consequences because he was using the same day over and over and over again, but he wasn't using it for good. And, you know, when I was, you know, I was, had that initial shock and, in the confusion of, of having MS and then, you know, I, I come back and in, you know, to reality a little bit and, and it dawns on me, well, wait, this is, so I guess this is my life. I'm going to wake up each morning and I'm going to have this disease, this chronic disease. It's a time loop. 
you know, and and so I guess this is the way it's going to be. And and okay, so I'm gonna go, you know, meet meet with doctors and started trying to, you know, truly figure out what does this MS thing mean and, you know, how am I going to, you know, live with this and, and, and do everything. But I think much like Phil Connors in his situation where he realized he was stuck in this time loop, I didn't go around robbing banks and I didn't, you know, do things like that. But I don't think I was really, in those initial few months, I wasn't taking this MS thing. I, w I wasn't taking it as seriously as I should have been. Um, he might have viewed it as a superpower and obviously wasn't viewing having MS as a superpower, but I wasn't, I wasn't realizing that I needed to be taking care of, you know, my body and I needed to be focusing on that future ahead. Like this is serious. This is potential. I mean, this is forever, you know, potentially forever. I mean, ideally there'll be a cure to MS. Um, but you know, this is something that's forever and I didn't, you know, necessarily view it that way. Um, I almost, you know, I, I wanted to just imagine, you know, some alternate reality where it wasn't really occurring. So as the movie progresses, you know, he, he has his fun. You know, he, he can eat as many donuts as he wants to do. He can spend lots of money and, you know, and, uh, and he end up, you know, having, you know, maybe girls like him because, you know, he's able to learn all their, all their favorite things and, and stuff like that. But at, at a certain point for, you know, the character Phil Connors, it, it dawned on him where, it was just like, this is really, this is all there is. I'm stuck in this, you know, this is my forever and I, I can't get out of this. And I keep living these days and maybe I have a great day, you know, on this groundhog day, maybe, you know, I, I make great connections with people or, or maybe, you know, X, Y, and Z happens. The point is, is that then I wake up the next morning and it, it's all gone. All those memories are gone for everyone else. And for me, I keep reliving the same thing over and over and over again. There's one line in the movie where, you know, he asked, you know, uh, Phil was, you know, at a bar. He was talking to some local townspeople there and he asked, he was like, what would you do if you were stuck in one place and every day was exactly the same and nothing that you did mattered? And... It was at this point where you could see he was kind of entering the grief stage of what was occurring to him. You know, he, he had his fun, but then it just, it wasn't, it wasn't fun. It was, it was emptiness for him. And that's, that emptiness led to this grief. And for me, that, that certainly occurred where, you know, I was diagnosed in May of 2008 and it was at the Mayo Clinic. And it was almost like it was just like this, this fantasy that was occurring. Like I had no idea what was going on. You know, I fly off to this place. And I finally had an answer. I was so excited about that of being diagnosed. And, but then, you know, there's, there's no playbook that's out there for, or maybe there is, but you know, I wasn't reading the playbook of what to do after you're diagnosed. And, and plus, even if there is a playbook, I'll tell you what you need to do after you're diagnosed. It, for everyone, is different, you know. Everyone processes things differently, and 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 I can't say for one person that they need to do it this way. Like, oh, you need to go talk to a lot of people, and another person, you need to go hold yourself up and you know just keep to yourself because everyone's so different. And a lot of that, it's you almost learn about who you are. And that's how, you know, I learned a lot about who I was during that period of processing my diagnosis. And, and the hardest part was really, it was just that despair, the, the, the grief part of it, where I, I don't want to use the words where I started feeling sorry for myself, but I mean, that's just for lack of better of saying anything else at this time. That's really what it was. I was like, you know, that stage where it's like, this sucks. You know, 
because you have that initial diagnosis and it's like, bam, you know, and, and for me, the, the bam was, was, was a little bit easier to digest at that moment at the Mayo Clinic because there was a long, there was like a 10 year waiting period I had of trying to get an answer for all the health issues I was having. So finally getting an answer, you know, there was that relief, you know, but then, you know, yeah. You know, three, six, nine months down the road, it's like, crap, this is actually happening. I'm literally taking a shot every day. I have, you know, all these doctor's appointments and everything is going on in my vision. And I mean, it's just, it's nonstop. And, and, you know, and it did become like a grief period where I was feeling sorry for myself. And, you know, I was withdrawing, you know, from my family. Because I was like, you know, this isn't, you know, for them, it's not fair. This isn't what they signed up for. For me, it's like, why is this my life? You know, why, why did I have to get MS? And, you know, I didn't, you know, in, in the movie, Phil Connors, he inflicts harm on himself. I didn't do anything like that. And I didn't think that way uh, at any moment. But, you know, it's, you know, during the movie, he, you know, he was trying to like, you know, walk out in front of a bus. You know, he, he wanted to see like this, nothing I do is going to change anything. And it's like, he'd get hit by that bus, but then he'd wake up the next morning. You know, I got you babes playing. It's just like, he couldn't break the loop even when he was doing that. And, you know, I was, I was caught in my own loop of being diagnosed of MS and feeling sorry for myself and just like, I can't believe that this is, this is it. This is my life. But you know, for me and much like in the movie with, with Phil Connors, you know, at some point I started to make peace. I made peace with, you know, this is it. I, I do have MS and this is part of me. And, and this doesn't have to be a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, I must living a MS is always going to suck. I mean, but, but I can become a better person. I can embrace this. There are so many things that maybe I wouldn't have done in that different, you know, that other life that I was living and I'm on a different path now. I'm on a life, you know, a life less traveled and, there's, there's a lot of good in that to see, you know, with the writing that, that I do. I, I would never be writing now if it wasn't for being diagnosed with MS. And even within the movie that started occurring with, with Phil Connors where he realized he, he wanted to make himself a better person. He wanted to help people. You know, this... This, this arrogant weatherman who, who just wanted to go get a better job somewhere else realized that there's a lot more to life than that. And he started to become a better person. You know, he, he learned to, you know, play a musical instrument. He was, you know, helping out people all around town, you know, knowing, you know, when they needed the, these old ladies that always needed to get their car, you know, tire changed at the same time every day, catching a kid falling out of a tree at the same time every day. And, you know, for, for me, you know, it's like I embraced it. I, I, I embraced having MS and, you know, I, I started baking that's something I would have never done if I wasn't diagnosed with MS. I, you know, I, I spend a, a lot more quality time with my children that I would have not had the opportunity to do if I was still, you know, my previous career. So, you know, maybe this isn't all so bad, you know, and that's, I started, you know, it started dawning on me where, you know, I'm, kind of getting a chance to, to start over again with many things in life where maybe that previous career guy that, that I was, well, you know what? Now I'm a, now I'm a writer guy and there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually pretty cool. And a podcaster as, as it works now, you know, I'm, I'm more than, than who I was before in, in, and I'm not going to let it, 
you know, all because I was diagnosed with MS and I'm living with this disease, you know, I'm not going to become a lesser person. I'm going to become a better person. And, and as I did that and, you know, I was watching the movie and I saw Phil Connors do that, I, I was just thinking to myself, yes, exactly. Yes. You know, there's, there's so much that, that you, you can do so many things that you can make you a better person. There's a difficult part in the movie where, you know, there was a homeless man and you can see him kind of, you know, he's an older homeless man. You can see Phil Connors, you know, progress through the different stages where it's like initially he wouldn't, he would just ignore him, you know, and then, you know, he went from ignoring him to just kind of, you know, being like, okay, well here, here's, here's a little bit to, you know, he realized that the old man at the end of the day on Groundhog Day, he ends up dying of old age. And, and he was like, well, I got to fix that. So then, you know, on one of his many, many, many days that he's caught in this loop, he starts to feed him. You know, he brings him to a restaurant and gives him all this food and, and he's, he wants to help him get better. But the same, the same fate still keeps occurring. You know, the, the old man, he, he dies at, at the end of the day. And, you know, and the, the nurse, you know, was, was talking to him and she was just like, you know, sometimes people just die, you know, and I had to let that old person, the person that I was before by diagnosis, I had to let him go. And when I wasn't letting him go and when I was feeling sorry for myself, that's, you know, that, that's when I was stuck in a very dark period of my life. And I had to let that person go and I had to embrace the new person that I'd become. And the same thing had to happen with Phil Connors where he had to let that old person that he, he was, that arrogant, uncaring person, he had to let him go and become a, a newer and better person. And so there was a, a beauty of watching this movie and, and having this realization where it's like, you know, the two things aren't the same, but it, it feels, it feels so much similar. I hope you enjoyed our, our discussion today and you check out my next, uh, life less traveled. You can read my stories on my website at mjwentink.com. Once again, that's MJ. W E N T I N K dot com or look me up on Twitter at M J W E N T I N K. I enjoyed talk to y'all, talking to y'all about one of my favorite movies, Groundhog Day. And I look forward to chatting with y'all again very soon. Bye.